All right, who's ready to build their home, their house on solid ground this morning? Boy, do we need it, right? Again, I want to just say welcome. Thank you for being here at Madison Church. We like to say we're friends following Jesus together. Our whole purpose is just to invite more and more people to find and follow Jesus so that they might know the great love that he has for us. And so that's us. We thank you for being here. Again, if you're brand new, we'd love for you to connect with us with one of those little blue cards or hit that QR code. But yeah, we're in a brand new series. We've been in the book of Ephesians for months and months, and every little section of Ephesians, we've kind of turned it into a new series. And now we're on a series about the family because that's exactly where Paul goes in Ephesians chapter 5. And boy, is it perfect timing in our culture to talk about the need for strong families. Have you seen the world? Have you seen marriages falling apart? Families that are just struggling at every situation. Parents that are just like losing control of their kids and relationships are breaking down. The home is under attack, isn't it? The family unit, the the building block that God has designed for our culture, for our communities, uh, for us to know who he is. It's a deeper issue than just families need to be strong. It's a theological issue. It's a God issue because families were designed to reflect the glory of God and to show us what God was like, to give us strength. It is the primary vehicle that God has given us to disciple one another. Sometimes we think the church is the thing that's supposed to disciple, and they are, but first and primary is the home to disciple children, to grow up, to know who Jesus is, so that they can spend eternity with him. Sometimes we focus on the wrong things. Have you noticed that it used to be kind of incognito, and now it's like Satan is just full, bold on attacking the family. Uh, I'm not going to get into a big thing about the Olympics, but, but you see the affront to Christianity that is just in our culture. And it's like Satan himself does not want families to grow and to succeed. And he's throwing everything at us. Well, today we're going to learn maybe one of the most powerful things, powerful principles in your life as you become more and more like Jesus that will transform you, it'll transform your families, it'll give you everything that you need if you'll follow this one thing. And the topic is kind of hard. It's not a fun word. Submission. Can you say it with me? Submit. Some of you, your tongue just like stuck on it. It's like sub, 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 sub what? But we learn this from Jesus. Would you take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 2? Philippians chapter 2 is a passage that we read often, and I tell you every single time, this is a passage that needs to get deep inside your heart. Uh, I would love for you to look it up uh, on your phone, out of your Bible, take the chair Bible that's in front of you. It's page 1040. To read this is just mind-blowing if you understand what it's saying, how Jesus Christ himself submitted himself to the Father and submitted himself to serve us to become a humble servant. Would you stand with me as we read God's word today? This is Philippians chapter 2. We're going to read all the way through verse 11. If then there is any encouragement in Christ... If any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way. Having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Wouldn't that just fix most of the world? Or conceit. But in humility, consider others as more important than yourself. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Where do we learn this? Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity, and when he had become as a man, he humbled himself. By becoming, what's the word? Obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. But for this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord 
to the glory of God the Father. Father, we rejoice in this Jesus that you have given us, this person, this fully co-equal with God person of the Trinity who voluntarily humbled himself to come to this earth so that he might die on a cross for our sins and bring us back into relationship with you. Jesus was humbled. And so this morning, we're humbled to be able to be your servants, to be able to uh, witness the glory of the gospel and to participate in it. We pray that you would teach us what submission means. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Some of you know that I was on a, like a six-week sabbatical, and it was awesome. And one of my goals in that, I even have the book up here, is this, uh, my least favorite, favorite book, not the Bible. It is The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. It's painful, I'm just telling you. Because I, I'm a hurry, I'm a go-getter, I go, like to do, 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 and just go, 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 and it's hard for me to rest unless I'm doing something, right? And, and so I'm practicing this, I'm rereading this book for the second time, and I'm just like, okay, I've got to learn how to slow down, I've got to learn some patience in my life, I don't have work right now, like I really got to figure this thing out. So what did I do? I started doing stuff. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, pray for me. Uh, one of the first things on my list was I got to get the truck emissions done. So I take my truck down to the emissions thing. Some of you have been over there on Peoria where it's at. And how many of you are just like me? Somehow you have a gift. You have the gift of picking the longest, slowest line at emissions. Like anybody else have that gift? Uh, I don't think it's a spiritual gift, but I have that gift, all right? So I'm sitting in the truck, and of course, no air conditioning, so I have to turn it off because it's going to overheat. I'm in this long line, and I'm just sitting there, and it's like, so Lord, you want me to practice on not hurrying, right? <laughs> Is this a test? Is this what you're doing? About four cars up, I finally figure out why my line is going so slow. It is literally the slowest emissions person I've ever seen in my life. Like all the other guys, I don't know if they're just giving them 20 bucks and passing them through and say, go ahead and go. My guy, he's walking like this, over to get the thing that goes on the muffler, you know, and then he, he puts it over there and he puts that on, then he stands up and then he walks over here. And he's just going so slow. I was tested in my patience, let me just say that. But I've learned, you know, just to, just to twist things, have a different perspective and say, Man, I bet you that man just needs Jesus, right? And some vitamins or something. I don't know. Like, I don't know why he was moving so slow. And then on the way home, of course, you know who you run into. You, anybody else love those slow turners? They put their blinker on. They slow down to about zero in the left-hand lane, and then they slowly start to turn it. And you, I have trouble being patient. <laughs> and you know Why? Because within that, there's this piece of submission, of waiting for somebody else, of submitting. You know what the Bible says? We're to submit to the governing authorities that actually didn't line in those things. But we hate our flesh, that selfish part of us, hates to submit to things. We want to be our own boss. And I think that's one of the primary reasons why this topic today is so hard for us to learn about submission, because there's just something in us that's like, no, nah, I need to be in control here. I want to do things at my own pace. The other problem is just a complete misunderstanding of what submission means in the Bible. Because the world has a definition. Let me just show you the Google definition up on the screen. The world's definition is this. The action or fact of accepting or yielding to, here's the hard word, a superior force or to the will or authority of another person. Because if there's a superior, what does that mean? There's an inferior. And isn't that exactly what we feel when we're submitting? Well, then I must not be as valuable as this person. And so when we say the word submission, it feels like a value judgment upon people. And so like with God, okay, I'm okay with that, right? Because he's obviously more valuable than me. He's created everything. He's all powerful. He's done all these amazing things. So, yeah, I can submit to God. But other people, our leaders, our government, the slow missions guy, I've got to submit to that. It's hard, isn't it? But then we began to gaze upon Jesus. 
and we see how Jesus lived his life. And we see through Philippians 2 that he was not inferior to God. What did it say about him? Uh, we're coerced into. It's something that we, because of the love that's in our heart that's overflowing, we choose to submit. John 14, 31 shows that this is exactly what was in Jesus' heart in that Philippians 2 passage. So that the world may know that I, what? Love the Father, I do as the Father has commanded me. He submitted himself to the Father. Why? Because he loved the Father. And so it's just radically different. For God so loved the world that he gave, right? Why did he give? Because he loved and so there is this love factor that goes along with submission. And then I found another one, which we're just working towards an impossible definition of submission. Hebrews 12, 2. Look what this says. We're to keep our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And then it says this. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. How in the world does the cross and joy go together? It's not that, I don't think the scripture is telling us that Jesus was like, yeah, I'm so excited, I'm so happy I'm gonna die on the cross. But he, he was looking forward to something else that would happen, that the relationship would be restored between us and him and that we would have this beautiful thing called relationship with Jesus through the gospel. And I think that's the same thing James has in mind when he says, when you encounter various trials, what are we supposed to do? Count it all sure that we're going to gain from this. Now, parents, we kind of get this, right? Maybe not for ourselves, but we get it for our kids. It's like there are things we're willing to sacrifice now so that our kids will have something better in the future. We submit to the, the needs of the moment so that later there can be this amazing joy that comes as we watch our kids grow and develop. But submission is really comfort. And I said it's, it's, it kind of feels impossible. Look at this. Biblical submission is the voluntary and loving decision to serve someone other than myself. Now, maybe you guys didn't need that, but I kind of need that reminder. <laughs> this is submission to serve like just being plain bold with it. This is about not about you serving yourself. This is about you serving someone else. Why? For the joy that comes from giving glory to God. First of all, it's voluntary. We see that in Jesus, right? He he was equal with he was equal with God, but he he made this voluntary decision to set those rights aside to be obedient, to be a servant. It's loving, it's motivated by this love, not a, not a coercion, not a dominance, but a, but a love relationship that says, I want to serve someone other than myself, and I recognize that there's gonna be a joy on the other side of us. In this, it may not feel like joy, but if I can put my eyes on the future, what God has for me, if I can recognize that this is not for my glory, but for his glory, I can find some joy in submission. Now, if you want to change your family, your family, I want to just show you our verse for today. Now, I'll just go back like two pages probably for you to Ephesians verse 21. He's going to say this, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. We are to submit to one another. There is to be some type of submission between us in the fear of Christ. And that gives us our first like major point today. Biblical submission begins with submission to who? Christ. To Christ. In fact, that's the, that's the pinnacle of it. That's the core of it. When we're thinking about submission, we're thinking all about submitting ourselves to God. But there is something in us, isn't there? <laughs> we're like, no, I don't want to do it. Don't touch that. What do we want to do? Touch it. Don't open that box. Really? <laughs> what do we want to do? We want to open the box. There's something in us that, and I think it goes all the way back to the garden because we just don't believe God sometimes. Remember what happened to Eve? It's like, uh, are you sure that God's not holding something out on you? He's told you to submit to him, and yeah, sure, everything's awesome. But what about this tree? You haven't really eaten from this tree. What if God has something else for you? 
And she falls for it. Adam falls for it. We all fall for it on a daily basis, don't we? And so instead of a serpent on a tree, listen to them. Now we have to train ourselves to, by the grace of God, have faith to believe in a Savior who hung on the tree so that we might be forgiven, so that we could have this new life with him. And it comes from the very first step. Did you know that, like, you can't have relationship with Jesus. You can't go to heaven unless you first submit yourself to Christ. Some of you may think that maybe that's why I took a sabbatical, because I needed six weeks to prepare for this moment to say, wives, <laughs> submit to your husbands. Look at verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Now, let me just start with this, because there's some of you listening right now, listening online and in the room, it's like, ah, I'm not married, not for me. <laughs> I don't have to pay attention to this, all right? Like, I already tried that, divorce now, whatever. It's like, I don't, I don't need to listen to any of this. Everything that we learn in the wife's submission to the husband is gonna be a valuable thing for you to learn biblical submission to God. If you're a follower of Jesus, the Bible says, and even in this passage, it's gonna say, Jesus is like our husband and the church is like the bride. And so we all have to learn how to submit to Christ. So everything that we learn is gonna be of value. Some of you are like students and you're young and you're like, yeah, 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 I don't need to be worried about that right now. Well, someday you're gonna pick a mate, and if you're a guy and you're looking for a girl, you're gonna to wanna to find somebody that can submit to her husband. And if you're a girl looking for a guy, you need to know how to choose a husband that you would even ever consider submitting to. So it's very important for all of us. And to, and to kind of dig words in this passage, the first one is submit. What does submit mean? Uh, we'll put it on the screen up here. Submit, uh, the Greek word is hypotasso. And it just means to place, and we're gonna show you what the biblical meaning is, and I think you'll like the way it comes out at the end. Now, the second word that's so important for us to understand is this word head. Husbands, submit to your wives as to the Lord, because the husband is the what? The head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. So there's some similarity between the way the husband is the head of the wife and the way Christ is the head of the church. Now, look at this word. It's kephale. There may not be another Greek word argued about as much as this word, kephale, uh, in the Christian culture. I think it's pretty simple if you just follow simple uh, uh, logic here. There's a couple of meanings. Pretty simple if you just follow simple uh, uh, logic here. There's a couple of meanings it can have. One is physically your head. And I don't think Paul is saying that. He's not saying like the husband is like, the head. that's just weird, right? He's not saying it's physically a head. There's some kind of metaphorical meaning that, that Paul is attaching to this. And the most common one in scripture is authority. Like the head in charge, like over, all right? It can mean source, but source is a usage that's only used literally of a river, like the, the head of the river is the source where the river comes out. So it's, a, it's used literally, but it's never used metaphorically. Like the coming out of the river is like a metaphorical, you know, uh, way of explaining this. It, nobody likes the last one, right? Preeminence. We know it doesn't mean that. That somehow the husband's the best one and the most awesome. And so, because uh, that gets us to inferior. That would mean if we take that logic out that Jesus was inferior to God, the Father. And that would be horrible theology. That would be heresy. So when we look at the context, I think it becomes very clear. Now, how it plays out, that's a different conversation, but I think it's very clear the meaning here because you have to try to make it mean something different, but I don't think it's necessary. Now, some of you are like, okay, I, I really don't like the way this is going. So wives have to submit to their husbands. I think that's what the text said, but what does that mean? All right, a few things that it does not mean. First one is submission is not about the workplace. I got like the first three of these from, I think it was J.D. Greer, and I just like this one. Submission is not about the workplace. What does it say? Wives to your husbands. It's not talking about out in the world, all women have to listen to men. That's kind of what our culture has done for centuries, hasn't it? But that, that's not what this scripture is teaching. It's saying wives to your husbands. Very exclusive in that. Now, the second thing is submission is not about dominance. 
And this is what most of us are worried about. We're thinking that if, if the wife is submissive to the husband, then that means the husband can manipulate, can dominate, and can boss her around and make her do whatever he wants. There's nothing further from the biblical meaning of submission. We've already looked at where it comes from. Domination is not even in his disciples. Now, this has been done for centuries. People have used it to dominate women. But, but Jesus was not like that. I heard this not too long ago. It says, anytime you have to pull the authority card, something is broken. I thought that was so good. Like if, and, and there's positions at work and different times where, where you're the authority, even with your kids. Like when you have to pull the authority card, that means something has broken down. Somebody's rebelling. Somebody's not uh, doing what they need to be doing. Somebody's not being encouraging. There's sin going on somewhere. If you're tempted to quote this verse to your wife, you need to reevaluate everything you're doing to lead her and love her. There's something broken in your leadership. Now here's super important. I think you guys are smart enough to see this, but it's so important to mention. Submission is not about abuse. If somebody is verbally, physically, sexually abusing you, mentally abusing you, you need to get help right now. And you need to get some safe boundaries in place to protect yourself. Many of you have been in relationships and you're finally to a place of freedom because you've been in an abusive relationship where somebody used the Bible to beat you over the head and say, you have to do what I say. That is not what God wants for you. I love John Piper. He said, submission does not have anything to do with living in fear. It's about living in love. Did you notice, too, that it says, uh, Jesus Christ himself. So if you're ever in a situation where submitting your husband or whatever the circumstances are, you're, you're feeling like you're supposed to submit to that, but you see women have submitted to their husband instead of God, and the relationship has spiraled into decay because God wasn't in it. So you really have to rely on the spirit. That's why we need friends. That's why we need counselors. That's why the elders are here to kind of understand. Now, those first three, I think, were from J.D. Greer. The fourth one is from me because I see this so much. Submission is not an excuse. Obviously, first of all, not an excuse for the husband to dominate, to sin, to get away with whatever he wants, to have the furniture organized the way he wants it, you know, to, to have the car that he wants to drive. It, it's not an excuse for you to dominate that way. But I see this too. It's not an excuse for wives to kind of acquiesce to whatever the husband wants. That's damaging to your relationship. Sometimes it's out of fear, just I'm shy, I don't really want to say what I'm thinking, and you need to grow in that. And other times it's just passive aggressive. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You don't want to admit it, but you know what I'm talking about. It's like, he's going the wrong way. <laughs> we are going to be stuck in the wrong traffic. He's going the wrong way. I don't really want to help him because it's kind of fun to watch him squirm. <laughs> if he asked me, I would submit, right? Like, submission is not a, an excuse to acquiesce from helping your husband. Every single relationship you're in right now, and it has a spirit of submission in it. Remember, we're to submit to one another in the fear of Christ. How can I help? Not how can I win? Isn't that what's wrong with most of our relationship struggles? We're in it to win it. I've got to be right. I've got to, I've got to come out on top. I've got to keep control. Our motives need to be to serve and to help others. And whether you're husband, wife, whether you're dealing with your kids, whether you're at the workplace, if you could just change your mindset to say, in this situation, God, how do you want me to help? Not how can I win? you want me to help, not how can I win? Here's a little hint. Every time you're feeling like you need to win, that's probably the flesh. <laughs> that's probably the selfish part of your nature that's like, oh, I, I got to be right in this. I got to get this the way I want it. And when you feel the spirit of helping, that's probably the Holy Spirit saying, how can you help in this situation? What is the need in this situation? What is the real thing that needs to be done here? I confess to you guys a little while ago, some of you know my struggle in competition. 
still go to the gym to play basketball. I've made some progress, all right? But you know what I'm thinking? I gotta win. <laughs> I need to win this game. I need to make this shot. I need, to, I need to do something awesome here. As God begins to transform my heart, nobody's getting paid out there. <laughs> what if I had just had an attitude of helping people, encouraging people, a couple of weeks ago, a guy, I, brand new at our gym, and I just started up a conversation, turned out to be a Seventh-day Adventist that wasn't uh, religious at all at this point in his life, and we just started a conversation. The church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Some of you just want to cross that word everything out. <laughs> Can you believe that's in there? It said everything. That's crazy, but that's what the Word of God says. But do you see the divine design here? Now let me just tell you one thing that's really cool about following Jesus, especially when it comes to wives submitting to your husbands and husbands loving your wives, guess what? It works. Like if you will humble yourself and do your part and play your role, if you will submit to your husband who's then the loving person who's uh, serving you and, and meeting your needs, it's just this beautiful synergy what happens is sin gets involved and we both refuse to do what God wants us to do and it begins falling apart. This is the same thing that God wants in our relationships in the church. If we're all trying to win, we miss the divine design that God has for us that he has put us together to submit to one another to help put us together to some divine purpose. And you see this language all through this passage of Christ and the church our relationships, with our service to God, the way we parent, all of these things, they glorify God and, and, and we can delight in the oneness that God has created when things are working. It's like a, it's like a drama of the God. You just kind of acquiesce. If you kind of step back from what God is calling you to, there's a piece of Jesus that nobody gets to see because you're not displaying it. The picture of God is incomplete without you this morning. Whatever your role, married or not, like we cannot get a view of God in just the male species. God has created male and female. You sometimes wonder why Christians get so bent out of shape about all these things going with gender and all these different things. It's because it's directly related to the glory of God. And what he has created for us to see who he is and how much he loves us. It's crucial. Again, the question how comes up. I'm going to give you three things. And again, if you're, uh, you're not a wife and you're thinking, oh, this isn't for me. No, this is because God has called us to submit to one another. Husbands, this is for you. Three practical things. Here's the first one. Assume the best. Just assume the best. We're so bad at this. You remember? Scriptures, 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says, love uh, believes all things, endures all things, hopes all things. Like love is just always saying, it's gonna be, we're, we're gonna get there, it's gonna, it's gonna happen. And so many times we come into relationship situations and we just know that that person has a sinister motive inside of them. I know why they left that out. They're just trying to torture me. They know I like this stuff put away. And they just left it on the counter. What are you going to do? So I'm trying to destroy us. They're trying to mess with us. I can't believe she didn't put gas in the car again. She just, she just wants me to run out of gas somewhere. Right? And we just need to assume the best. There is a reason why you married that person, right? <laughs> because you loved them. Because they loved you. What if you just began to assume? Now, if they show you like abusive patterns, I'm not saying anything. Now, if they show you like abusive generally, don't wake up every morning thinking, how can I destroy my wife today? <laughs> They're really trying. <laughs> Assume that they have good motives. Shanti Feldon has this great way of saying it. She says, uh, look for the most generous explanation of everything. <laughs> like, okay, well, maybe they were just tired or maybe they just didn't see it. It's so easy to assume the wrong to assume horrible things. This happens at work, doesn't it? Oh, they never get their report in on time. I know what they're, they're trying to get me fired, right? And we just spiral into all these things and maybe they just left early and forgot to do it. Assume the best. 
Now, here's another one. I think this one might be the best explanation of what it means to be a submissive wife. Would you just please help him win? You know, Genesis 2.18, what does it say? Before sin, no sin on the planet, God says, yeah, it's not so good that he's, he wants to serve you. He just needs a little help, some helpful hints along the way. I've told you, like Gail has gotten so much better at this. Like, okay, honey, right now, I just need you to listen. Okay, got it. <laughs> and then, <laughs> then I go right into fixing it again. And she's like, no, 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 you don't understand. I just need you to listen. Remember what you said? Remember what you preach? Listening is fixing, right? We got to remember that. But just help him. He needs help. If we do this, we're going to make better marriages. Uh, especially moms, when you're, dealing with, when you're dealing with your male sons, you're dealing with, like, even them, they just need a little bit of help. Here's the most powerful one, I think, though. You just gotta, you gotta choose encouragement over criticism. Criticism is the killer. And, and I know it's hard because your husband's probably a professional criticizer, all right? But encourage one another, build each other up. I, I was thinking of like, encouragement is your superpower, all right, ladies? And criticism is kryptonite. Gail and I, when we were first married, I was a professional criticizer. I think I'm amateur now, but I was a professional back then. Nearly destroyed our marriage. Uh, had to go into counseling, had to have somebody uh, show that to me and begin to try to root that out. To learn to be kind. To, to, to learn to be caring in every situation. It will change our lives. And it reminds me of this verse, Ephesians 4.32, be kind and loving to each other and forgive each other just as God has also forgave you in Christ. And I think if we would just grab hold of this, it would begin to change our relationships with our kids, with our families, with our spouses at work. One of the things that stuck out to me when we were struggling, and I just wanted to blame Gail for everything in our relationship and it took a counselor to show me that actually, no, you're supposed to be leading this thing. It's mostly your fault. But what changed my heart was I said, there's not a single thing that she has ever done to me that I haven't done to Jesus multiple times. And it produced an attitude of repentance in me to humble myself and to ask for forgiveness. I don't know where you're at this morning, but I'm guessing you're just like me. You need to be more kind. You need to learn to be submissive in the relationships God has given you. We're going to close with a time of prayer, and uh, we're going to have some prayer partners uh, around the congregation. You just see somebody standing by one of the pillars. Just go over to them and ask them for prayer. We want to help you with this. You need to walk with people. Some of you need to uh, just make a commitment to be here Wednesday night to learn more. You need to buy the book even today before you leave so that you can begin to work on being kind. Would you stand with me as we pray? Father, most of all, we thank you so much for your kindness to us. The kindness of Jesus to submit himself to you and becoming obedient even to death on the cross so that we might have life with you. Such a powerful picture of what it looks like to serve others instead of ourselves. Would you help us to just take this one thought of kindness, begin to maybe assume a little bit better explanations for things going on in our lives, be able to just help people instead of always trying to win in every situation. God, we, we need this so much. We pray that we would encourage one another as you have encouraged us this morning. If you're here today and maybe you don't know for sure if you have a relationship with God. You don't know if you're in the, whatever you want to say, the funnel of kindness that God, is God going to pour out kindness or is it going to be judgment on you? That only happens if you put faith in Jesus Christ. You can be forgiven of your sin and once and for all, you can walk in Romans 8, 1 that says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
I'm, I'm guessing that there's some of us this morning that just need to do a little bit of work of forgiveness. I wanna just lead you in a prayer right now. Would you just say these words out loud with me? Everybody together, maybe you help somebody else. Just say, dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need your help. I trust you. I believe in you. You died for me to forgive my sin. I wanna follow you. I receive your forgiveness. Help me to walk in love and kindness. In Jesus' name, amen. You come if you have a need to pray.